So uh, we are the GHPC team, uh, three of us at least, myself, Harry, I'm the art lead. Uh, we got Josh, action scripter, uh, uh. the founder of the project and programmer. We got Kevin, mission slash terrain guy, and we are here with uh, Eugen Systems. I'm not sure if I pronounce it right. It's not French enough, maybe. Uh, Eugen Systems consisting of Mad Matt, the, uh, the big man himself. Um, Panzer, who I believe is the art lead, is that correct? Um, a, a part of it, yes. Yeah. And we got, uh, what name do you want to use? HRC AK-47. I would. I am associate um, associate member of Eugene, and I'm helping with historical accuracy and this nerdy stuff that we are all talking about. All right. So, um, as I've mentioned on prior interviews we did, um, we just sort of uh, have been contacting a few developers we know because uh, it turns out that the the sim development scene is a lot smaller than people would imagine. And we thought we uh, it would be interesting for listeners to hear some like shared experiences and stuff like that. Um, I will get you guys to start off, um, jump in, whoever wants to go, uh, with an elevator pitch to your product as if to a completely uninitiated listener. So the product, of course, being war, war game slash war no, I suppose. Both of them, do you want to talk about both? Or I guess they're kind of the same game in a way. So actually, we are much more focused on Warno than War Game. So, how would you describe Warno to somebody who's never heard of it before? Uh, it's a Cold War, Cold War RTS. Uh, it's as much as a simulation as possible, uh, while sta uh, remaining a, a real-time strategy game. Cool. We don't have. Um, uh, what do you say, uh, base building, that's so apart from RTS we don't have, but we are on really a simulation. We are trying to, to navigate between both, uh, both genres. Now when you say simulation, what are some of the deeper parts of the simulation that you think are, are pretty close to reality? Uh, having um, uh, armor facing, different armor values depending uh, uh, on, uh, on each vehicle, uh, ammo count, uh, and uh, especially uh, that's about uh, units. But uh, we're also trying to to respect uh, historical the table of organization of and equipment. T uh, I don't know you say in English T O E uh, and order of battles to represent not only just the units, but uh, every nation's forces at a tactical level. Yeah, that was something that impressed me about Warno coming from a uh, war game to Warno, how you can actually see which specific units are participating and what uh, what their equipment set is and how they differ from each other. It's pretty cool. I imagine there's a lot of research that must go into <laughs> that. That's, uh, that's some pretty deep lore. We have very similar... Um, backstories to both of our games. I think the year is different, but the location and the concept is very similar, so we're probably treading a lot of the same ground when we do uh, research, especially on equipment. How have you guys found that process? And whoever, whoever wants to jump in can jump in. Matt, if you agree, can I take this one? Yeah, go on. Okay, so basically the Cold War in Germany is probably one of the most underrated historical settings. It has so much untold stories and there's like so much nerd stuff that has been so much underrated in the last years. And with the rot of the internet that's going on, we basically have less of that knowledge, not more. So basically, um, this research that we do, uh, we focus on the minute details uh, that have not yet been um, known so much in the pop culture, not, ev not even in the culture of people that are really into this stuff. So we take pride in that by researching a lot of primary sources and just like going in as wide and as deep as we can possibly can. Nice. Uh, you talk about the rot of the internet. Are you talking about things like... Uh 
old blogs that people have put up that have very uh, intricate details suddenly being lost or taken down, that sort of thing? That stuff is basically gold. Like, I remember myself, like, in middle 2010 or earlier than that, just, like, browsing these, re like, really old rackety sites that uh, just have uh, an immense wealth of knowledge that were made by the people that were actually doing that stuff, and now they're, like, lost and gone, and not even the Internet ar Archive has them. You can sometimes just, like, find a glimpse on them on some... Uh, in some archive sites, but usually it's just not enough. And I just look at it and I'm like sad seeing it. Yeah, you get a bit of um, uh, like forums go dead. And um, there are a lot of like ebook sites where people used to put up scans of stuff that you can't get in print anymore. And that's all dying off because, you know, like mega upload doesn't exist and all this kind of thing. Uh, technically, I think the legality of that stuff was gray. But if it's out of print, like, doesn't exist anymore functionally and then you got like ai model collapse as well like half the time you'll load a page up and it's like okay this is an ai page that's just aggregated a bunch of other stuff and it's not actually new information or whatever <laughs> yeah it's been um, a challenge to do i mean for me on this project it was new having to do this much research um i never realized just how much garbage there is on the surface layer of trying to find something. Like if you try to look up information about a T-72, you're not gonna find a tank of grad as your first result. You're gonna find some kind of summary page that has a bunch of mixed information and it doesn't properly list the variants and you don't know. So once, one such tank is actually preserved deep in Russia, but we only saw it at a glimpse of a picture in one village. And they basically put a label on it, and it says it's um, a wrong variant of that tank, but it's actually this obscure tank that we were looking for. And through that, we managed to find a lot of uh, pictures and managed to get a walkthrough around that tank so we could get enough data to have it modeled in 3D. Yeah, well, there you go. I think it's the it's a hardest tank to, to get uh, information about it. Yeah, it's always a, a battle when you try to to talk about it, and um, we often have some people who still say that somehow models are wrong because of all the years of bad uh, information they they have got about them. Yeah, that must be a, a pretty constant theme for you guys, right? People looking at your stat cards and uh, saying, well, that doesn't match what I know about this vehicle. Uh, you need to change it. Well, always, yes. <laughs> sometimes, we, sometimes we do uh, are wrong. Actually, uh, actually uh, Lucas uh, joined us because he was doing that uh, constantly nitpicking about, uh, about <laughs> stats. Stats and models. Uh, so finally, we, we took him in. It, it was easier and quicker to to fix things i was wondering about that actually from you guys' perspective i'm uh i'm still stuck on wargame red dragon i can't stop playing it um but i have noticed that uh the community they complain a lot like a lot and um despite complaining all the time they keep coming to your game and they won't they can't stop um i don't have any complaints about either game i think they're both fine um i don't jump on the forums and say anything about it but i'm wondering what do you think uh do you think i mean in our case we've sort of observed a few like um there's other games where i think that complaining is almost part of the meta game do you think that's developed for you guys or do you think it's more like they just really want it to be the game that they think it like they've got a picture of a game in their head and they think that it's going to be that if only they complain enough or something like that. Uh, Mad Matt yeah. uh, is the one who suffered the most about uh, that uh, during war game, so I, I will let him uh, answer that. I think there's many reasons. There's people who think they know better, some actually do. Uh, there's, there's nationalism. Uh, we've been accused of everything from being uh, uh, slaves to Germany, to French beer, to uh, uh, 
commies by Americans or the opposite by uh, Russians. So actually everybody uh, accuses us of something. So I think somewhere we find some balance uh, and some neutral neutrality uh, between nations. Uh, I think uh, the issue, we have less issue with, um, with World War II than with, with Cold War because uh, I think in World War II, uh, we have definitive uh, stats about vehicles, while uh, for Cold War, some stuff are still secret, or there are still a lot of myths, especially about, as we said, T-72. Uh, we, a lot of people think it's, uh, it's a bad tank, or so, because uh, the export versions were as good as the Soviet one. Uh, but... Uh, and, and this also you've got uh, uh, Cold War equipment is still used today and uh, with different ammunition, with uh, different uh, armor package. So people mixed up a lot of things about, uh, about the Cold War. I think it, uh, there's no definitive answer uh, about the Cold War, like for World War II. So there's a lot of room for argument. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Go ahead, I think Eric. in a way that's kind of um, that's kind of what makes it unique. It's like it's the war that everyone was promised and never happened. So everyone's got these these crazy ideas about how it was going to play, and uh, there's no way to say that you can't point at any data really of how it would have actually gone down. So it's always like one person's fantasy versus another person's fantasy, I suppose. Uh, that's the first thing I, I would say about uh, Warno. It's um, for me, it's a Cold War simulator. Uh, it's uh, way above uh, simulation. It's really um, uh, interarm simulation. Uh, what we we want to achieve is uh, it's more than just stat and simulation. We want to put the player in the shoes of someone who need to use all weapon at the same time synchronize uh, to win. Uh, it, weirdly, it's very hard things to achieve in a RTS. In any, any tactical or strategic game, interarm is uh, very difficult to do. That's why um, I love Cold War, because it's modern enough to have a, a very interesting interarm uh, strategic, uh, strategic uh, scale, and in it's not uh, too much modern uh, to have some part of the inter arm uh, literally disintegrated by the, some parts. Uh, for example, uh, air, uh, air defenses, uh, uh, electronic countermeasure, uh, things like that is uh, in Cold War around 1989. It's almost perfectly balanced and you can do uh, a very interesting game about that. If you put 10 years in the future or 10 years in the past and you will be in uh, a strange place or to, to balance again for this objective, interim gameplay. It does seem like the 80s are the, the golden era for this matchup. Uh, I've, and I've noticed you guys have, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like in Warno you're going even more strict on the, uh, the the stats being real, so to speak, and backing them up with history, and not as much on the balance. That could just be my perception. Is that true? Yes. We, just like we did with uh, Steel Division 2, we are trying to stick much more to reality in Warno than we did in, in Wargame. The... Uh, the era we covered in Wargame was from 75 to 95 for some prototypes, even further. Uh, here we are sticking to, to 89, with, uh, since in uh, our Ukraine uh, there has been some, uh, some marching to war, so we allow ourselves to pick some stuff from, uh, from the, the first Gulf War. So it's really 89 to, to 91. Uh, so yes, we're, we're trying to stick, uh, to stick to reality more. And uh, we don't have, uh, as uh, Stefan said, uh, 
in between 85 and 89 it's pretty much balanced after that NATO is way too powerful and uh, in the early 80s it's still the pact with each uh, each too powerful so by, by sticking to that small period uh, we can achieve a better balance have you found that it's been pretty feasible to stick to realism more or have you found some issues balancing once you made that commitment no, it's uh, it's actually easier to balance in Warno, uh, especially with the divisional systems and uh, in war games. Uh, just one point: make this assessment true. Uh, we doesn't want to simulate night battle because the differences between the two sides in night battle at this time uh, would would be a nightmare to simulate. Mm. So Talking about thermal optics. Yeah. Camel optics, yes, uh, uh, packed doctrines, uh, and way above being hard to balance, it would be probably not very fun. And before all, we want to stay uh, in the optic of uh, being fun, of course. Uh, simulation, but fun before. Very cool. I've uh, heard similar things from pretty much every developer of a uh, Cold War game that we've talked to. Everyone pretty much says that, yeah, we like to go for the realism and uh, not worry about the balance so much and then just try to get the balance in a, an asymmetrical way in, or uh, or just kind of take it where they can get it. But everyone who gets this deeply into the subject matter seems to really embrace the research and uh, understanding how things actually would have been. And I think it's interesting when it uh, it's first put in front of people because they have those preconceptions about specific tanks or, or armies and how the capabilities would have been. And it's, uh, you know, you have to kind of break through those preconceptions if you have better information. It's always interesting to see how that goes in each community. I know you guys made a bit of a splash when you did your uh, armor rework recently in Warno with the uh, the new stats that you researched. How did that go? Uh. <laughs> well, we can't make any change, especially a major one without uh, hurting someone or having some complaints. So all consider it went pretty well. And the uh, we, uh, problem was that um, some uh, original stats were more inspired by Wargame and after we added more and more units, we made more, we made more research and uh, and tried to to be more to stick more to reality. So at some point we had to to put everything uh, in balance. So uh, the, the the early access was a good time for that. Yeah, I, I really think that uh, early access is a good way to uh, to do that. Uh, before, uh, when we use beta, beta was too short, and uh, when the game is released, if you do uh, something like that, uh, like a big revamp uh, of if anything, um, by the way, uh, armor, the air, uh, subject is not uh, is not important. If you do a revamp of something as huge as the armored one, uh, you will you will have a negative review, you will have uh, some bad feedbacks, even even long time before even the patch is out. So early access is a good way to um, to give players the situation and, and let uh, and give us some time to readjust uh, uh, in the right direction. It's more easy and and right now uh, after two years uh, uh, it's very fast to correct and uh, and to uh, to adjust uh, uh, patch. Uh, so so now uh, we we are close to be ready to uh, to get out of, of the early access. Yeah, early access it's is probably be great a, you, for us too. It's probably the same for you. Yeah, it's probably the same for you. No, definitely. But, We've certainly found situations where we have something that's essentially a, a working prototype when we first release it. It's it's just a step up from a developer tool. And it goes into the game, and then later on we say, you know what, let's polish this. Let's make it actually the way we would envision a final product being. And it's a surprising change for people who are used to it. But since it's early access, it's kind of expected, right? We have that leeway to to play around a little bit and make those changes. I would hate to think if we had released as a full game and then made 
overhauls to things, how people would be uh, upset. Like the one that I keep thinking of is when we removed, there used to be a, a list of text on the screen after you hit a target that showed exactly what happened. All Because the shots record all the information about what they hit and what they damaged. Um, that used to splash up in the corner of the screen. And people loved that. That was like a, a little dopamine hit. You know, if you, you take a shot and you see like penetrated commander's skull and hit ammunition, they're like, oh, it's so sick. Uh, well, we removed it because we wanted to go to um, visual effects to communicate the hits and not clutter up the screen and kind of leave that detailed information for after the, ba the battle. That was not a popular change. Uh, we, for a few days... It was kind of uh, all the comments that we got on Steam were like, why would you take this away? Bring it back. What are you doing? And then eventually, you know, new players joined who'd never seen it and it kind of died off. And now no one really brings it up. So I think early access is good. It's the, it's the right time to make those decisions yeah, and changes. You, you can take more risk in early access. You can try things you wouldn't do uh, after a release. Of, um, I'm pretty sure of that. And um, like the example you you, you describe, uh, you can react more with the players and avoid the shitstorm uh, at at what point. So yes, I, I think it's a, it's a better way to, uh, to. I love the way to produce a game like this. Yeah, but um, the other side of this world or the coin. It's that you need to to be. Uh, you probably know that because you do exactly the same. Uh, you have to be uh, alive for two years, and by alive, I mean you need to to. We need to do a blog every week. Uh, patch uh, and build need to be uh, very often. Uh, at what time we don't deliver a build for one month? I think just one month, maybe maybe more. And uh, it was like. Uh, Eugene is on strike, or we, Eugene is dying because there is no money anymore. You, you can't fight that. It's literally impossible. So that's the bad way to be in early access. You need to be active. It's like a marathon. Usually, when we did game before, and I work in video games in 25 years now, it was more uh, two years of a, a slow race and six months of a sprint. After that, and in this position now, it's more a three years marathon. It's very different, a different way to produce a game. I'm pretty sure it's better for the quality, but it, you will lose a lot of stamina or you know, uh, making a game like this. Uh, it's a marathon. That's the perfect word to describe uh, making a game from early access to release. And you need to be very active in some, in some. Uh, uh, specific domain we were not and we are still not very good at uh, communication marketing because you need to 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 keep the game alive and have avoid the uh, the gray uh, border of is the game is dead oh oh is there no builds in three weeks the game is dead the company <laughs> is dead because a lot of people were scammed by early access game elsewhere so you need to fight that a lot. You and guys very tedious. Yeah, you guys are in a better position than um, the default for that because you have a track record and a history of published games. So people, I mean, people are still going to say, "Is the game dead? Is the company on strike? Whatever." Like that's just how it goes. But probably fewer than if you were just an unknown outfit producing your first game in early access, right? Because for every person who says, oh, is the game dead, there's going to be someone else who says, well, it's it's Eugen. They they make games. Like, they're, they're going to be fine. Uh, but it probably also helps that you do these things so frequently. Like, I'm subscribed to your Steam page, and I get all of your blog posts about what's coming, and I find the communication to be really good. Um, probably one of the best out of all the early access games that I follow. You have consistent messaging, I like your your little French general theme that you have going on for the <laughs> releases. Um, you know, it's like I know what to expect, and then I I get the updates, and I say, oh, it's that time again, and I read it, and I say, cool, and you know, I have no doubt that the game is still cooking. So I think you have done really well in that regard. I think there's definitely a lot of mistakes you could have made that you did not, and I think it's been similar for us as far as the fast release pace. 
Um, th there were times we considered slowing down and saying, no, let's take two months, let's take three months, whatever, just release them when we feel really good about each feature. But committing to a, an update a month thereabouts seems to be a really strong signal to people who are watching the progress that yes, this is still happening, this is reliable. I think maybe uh, more than I expected at the beginning, it's, uh, it's very important to keep that cadence going. Yeah, yeah, we 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 see that on on all stats and uh, and wish list the progression thing like that. So so yes, it's working. So so you you need to do that. Uh, even it's exhausting. Uh, it's the good. It's the, I'm I'm not sure it's the perfect strategy, but at least you you need to do that. Uh, maybe one by week is 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 too much, but uh, every two weeks or maximum one build a month. Uh, is a good uh, is a good starter, yes. But for two years, two years. How many blogs, Matt? Matt, Matt we, we did. How many blogs we did on Warno? Uh, We're at I 90. think we have the number. On Warno, I do not have the number, but it's uh, one, one per one per week. So ninety nine. Yeah, yeah ninety nine. Someone told me the next one was the end, the hundredth. That's a lot. Yeah, I, that's uh, a lot. I don't think we've. <laughs> I done... know that. <laughs> I don't think we've done many blogs, but we do streams. We've taken a slightly different approach. We do a, a stream every two months, and then we'll do um, constant communication on Discord, which is uh, it has some pros and cons to it. I've noticed that um, some people handle access to developers very well and, and politely, and some do not. So we have to be very careful how far we extend like in uh, interaction like there are days where i just mute the discord and i go and work on my own and don't think about it and then sometimes when i'm feeling uh you know i've got the energy required i'll go and dive in <laughs> yeah with yeah. that uh definitely uh, I, we don't have a community manager so we we take a share on everyone try to, to communicate a little about what you do uh that's not uh that's not easy sometimes but uh it's necessary discord we we don't do much stream because it's not uh in your in your dna for now but i think it's uh it's something we we miss we have miss opportunity we have a lot of youtubers who who do some video about the game every every week every but uh it's probably something we we need to work uh, to work on uh, it's it's hard to to find the, the the good recipe when you're a small small size time uh, team because uh, you want to do a lot you want to do blogs video shorts uh, uh, talk with people on Discord uh, on Reddit um, and after the day uh, you have your own work to do and it's it's like I said it's exhausting for for two years yeah. I've certainly noticed that if I do heavy community interaction, I don't really have time to do my job, <laughs> like actually working on the game. It, it's like you have to pick one or the other on any given day or, or half day. If I'm going to be talking and explaining things and riffing with the community, I'm not getting any work done. That's just how it's going. I wish we had a dedicated community person sometimes, but then I look at the budget and I look at the, the size of the project and I say, okay, I can't really justify yeah. that right now. Uh, which that made me curious, actually, when you talked about having a small team and, and you guys have the same thing where you do your own community management. Um, how big is the team that's working on Warno? Uh, how much? Uh, around 20. Wow. Oh, on Warno? Yeah. There's 30, 35 people now uh, in, in Eugene. Okay, what's the what's the breakdown in like number of developers versus artists for you know that sort of thing? Uh, Steph, sorry. Uh, how how, can you break down it in, uh, between uh, uh, developers, uh, game designers? Uh, it's about. I, uh, like I say. Uh, 25% for art and uh, and design and the rest for for tech probably okay. around that numbers 
No, that makes sense. Uh, you guys have a lot of assets, a lot of a lot of 3D model stuff that has to be made for the number of units in the game. I imagine that takes a lot of coordination to get um, all of that produced. Yeah, it, it's it's a process, and now after so much game, we we have some good process to on one oh, we 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 had to uh, to push the the, the quality uh, levels. Uh, one step above for, for 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 some sectors. In fact, a lot of sectors uh, from uh, Steel Division Two to Warno. So sound, uh, FX, light. Uh, I, I, I take the I take I took the bullet for for, for that part, and I tried with uh, uh, with HK and Matt to uh, to raise and um, some people uh, at Eugen who, who did the models and textures. We we work on painters now. We um, we found some process to to keep the the coherence uh, between all the units. Uh, for example, I, I wanted to have the unit used, you know, used and dirty because uh, when you played, uh, the war has started from from one, two, three days. And uh, when I was in the army, uh, I can say that uh, a tank on the ground with B30 in, in one or two hours. So I, I wanted really to have this feeling of uh, the war is already here, and uh, we need to to have some pattern and process on Painter to do with this uh, easily, and to have some random uh, shift to to move the mud, the, the dust. Uh, uh, from uh, mo one model to another and to keep differences. Uh, that's That was a huge uh, step above for, for Warno. Uh, the other part was uh, the sound, because uh, each unit uh, has its own sound. Uh, light FX, uh, special effect uh, too. It was the same engine. We rewrite uh, some part of the code, but we try to to push it to the limits and for the same specification as still division 2 we put a lot more uh, punch here in in this game that was hard to 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 have all the process to do this uh, even in in one years because it was a short process work at the beginning of the pro project and then it just uh, you you do it for I don't know how many uh, units we have now, more than 1,000, I think. I did the short uh, two days ago, I can't remember we the number. We have above uh, 1,000 units uh, for the multiplayer division and uh, Army General, and more will come with uh, North SAG and South SAG DLC. So, yes, <laughs> big work. People I'm, sometimes uh, think that there's usually uh, that uh, the war game approach, where there's like all the funky prototypes and everything, would have more units. No, actually, it's the opposite. Uh, war no approach, where you divide everything into divisions, and then you go ultra uh, ultra exact uh, historical approach to it. Uh, you will actually end up with more units. So I am very confident that the unit amount in war no will grow a lot. So the, so the reason also for, for that is that uh, since uh, Steel Division, we've been able to add uh, a Toad unit, which we don't we didn't have in our game. Everything had to be self-propelled. We couldn't have uh, transport towing units. And uh, with Steel Division, we added everything from machine guns, mortar, horizons, and uh, mm -hmm. all the artillery and uh, anti-aircraft units. So that makes actually a lot more units as an, uh, in Wargame. And uh, we see infantry being much more detailed uh, and with more uh, interesting mechanics. We have a lot more uh, different infantry units. So that, counts, that also counts. The, the fun part is uh, we we also play uh, a lot of uh, of game of the Cold War. For, um, me and uh, I know me and uh, HK uh, play the Gunnery PC, of course. Uh, we play War Thunder, and it, it's it's fun because it, it's really a small world. Because I'm I'm pretty sure one day um, I work on on some special effects uh, on Warno, and one month after uh, I see something very in the same direction from 
uh, from our sender. And I think we all look at what uh, the, each other we, we did, and we, we it's like it's not copy; it's just we're feeling it. Is. Yeah, f for example, I want to uh, I wanted to uh, to see uh, all the tracers work uh, in Generate PC because uh, for me one thing very hard to do is tracers um, because uh, it's something different when you see tracers from uh, a tank to red uh, than when you see them from above and for Wano you can be uh, as close as as you in Generate PC to to see the tracers. And uh, in one second, you are above at uh, 500 meters, and you st still have to see the tracers. And it it was a nightmare because tracers are, for me, one of the the, the hardest thing to achieve for visibility, uh, but also uh, feeling guts, feeling impact, etc. So I, I was wondering around all the project to see well, how does it how do they do that and that, and it's interesting to see that we have probably come from, uh, facing the same problems, uh, but probably not at the same scale or the, the, the same direction. Um, same, it's the same for explosion, sound, uh, etc. I can but tell you right now, you, you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know how we do traces. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, I, I agree with you on that point about how we're all having to solve the same problems and we're coming up with um, solutions in our own way. But uh, yeah, I did want to mention that out of all the things that we have effects-wise in GHPC, I think tracers are one of the weakest. Um, they're, they're very simple. They don't have like a burnout time. They don't leave smoke. They don't have uh, a lot of the, the subtlety that you see on real tracers. That's like a project that we intend to do in the future. Uh, but I will tell you the way that I made them work temporarily, which as you probably know, a temporary there's nothing more permanent than a temporary fix when you are developing something uh, I just made them use the lightsaber technique you know where you they they take the gap from one frame to the next how far they've moved that's how long it is so it's like the um it's like when you have something very bright moving very quickly on film it's just a streak and the length of the streak is the shutter of the camera it's kind of the same the same idea so it's literally yeah. just a cylinder and then it, it's stretching oh itself. I see. I thought it was a cube. Isn't it a cube? No, it's it's a, a capsule. It's a capsule that oh, stretches okay. itself so, to the length of the travel distance for the frame rate. Yeah, so that's why sometimes it, the yeah so, sometimes the simple solution is a good one. But I, I can tell you something weird. I I, I asked Luca, I asked her about. I don't know. I I know that uh, Vaso Pact has green tracers and NATO one has red tracer. But can you find? Can you find? Literally, I ask him. Can you find me the the chemical components of the Vaso Pact tracer so I can find the good green uh, for the tracers? Because <laughs> this green is absolutely impossible to. I can't find. It. So he found me the chemical. Uh, he had documents about uh, what uh, chemical was used on tracers, uh, so I, I tried to be close to that. Uh, so, at, at what point you, you you don't even know? Or oh, please, please just tell me what green sodium? What was in the tracer? I, and I will look on the internet to uh, to see what uh, colors make the reaction, and then I will pick it uh, for, for for my special effects. At one point, it was that, and of course the speed, etc., etc. But we are in a um, in tactical area, so uh, for example, tracers need, need to be visible. Uh, if you do a simulation, uh, you will have some tracers and not very uh, visual, and you have to uh, to represent some fire volume. But for example, uh, the fact that a packed uh, tracer was uh, green and some. Uh, other was red, and for DDR it was orange, and for some um, SPAG it was yellow or red, uh, depending of uh, of this kind of thing. Uh, if I have the information, I will put it in the game because usually it will improve uh, the visual comprehension of the game, and it's cool. It's just cool. Uh, same for uh, proximity fuse for the FX uh, of SPAG, thing like that. 
Uh, what we did uh, last month is uh, also a special FX for uh, Fito. It was a uh, special uh, worried, but uh, Ashka will will talk about it, or Mathieu will talk about it better than me. And it was uh, usually you need uh, a special FX for that. But I will tell you the worst FX special FX I had to, uh, I, I had to do. It was for the MW1 uh, from the tornado. This weapon is absolutely insane to make in a, in special FX. Is that is that a cluster munition or something? I don't know this one. Uh, it's the German pod that you carry underneath the tornado and that pops off like four thousand uh, small bomblets to the side oh, and downwards. Oh. It is. It's a, oh. it's a dispenser. Uh, three days to make something close to the reality. And without uh, killing the performance, because it's it's uh, the hard part. Of course, I can send uh, all, all bullets, all uh, cluster bullet shell if I want, but I need to find. And that's the kind of task who is interesting in the RTS, because you need to to have the level of abstraction about the munition in gameplay, because you can't even simulate every bullet, of course. Uh, but you have to be uh, close to reality. You have to be impressive, and you have to uh, to keep this sense of visual. So when you are close to the ground or uh, way above your target, it's still impressive. And that's very hard to do for this kind of ammunition, too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially um, the visual effects. It's very easy to outrun your performance margins if you really go in on the high quality smoke and lighting and everything. For those, we had the same issues where. Uh, we have a really nice smoke shader with you know the six point lighting and all the motion vectors and everything and all all the tricks that you could expect and it looks very nice but if we do things like stack multiple smoke clouds on top of each other the overdraw starts to really kill the gpu so we have to be very careful how we deploy those and use uh use various methods to combine and reduce the effects when we can um it's always interesting to see like you can you can simulate the correct number of things, projectiles, particles, whatever, and then the game will chug and you, you can't do it. And then you release a, a reduced version. And we've seen something happen a few times where um, a modder will go in and say, oh, I'll, I'll set the number of fragments of a bomb to the realistic number, you know, hundreds of thousands of fragments. And uh, they try it and they say, oh, it's, it's really cool, but my PC can't handle it. It's, it's so funny. And then I'm just thinking, like, well, yeah, that's why we didn't do it. <laughs> we d we can't just kill everybody's PCs all the time to make a point. We have to try to find that balance. So it's always a thing. But you probably have the same same facing the same problems as uh, as us. You want to simulate. You want a game. You want to simulate something. Simulation is a word, but you want to simulate to simulate a war. You, and, uh, and the war, it's dust, it's smoke, it's uh, yes. fire in the wood. And uh, after a while, at, at the first, like I say, at the first contact with the enemy, you can you can hear birds uh, uh, thunder in the distance, but it's very quiet. But after 10 minutes, it's just hell around you, and you want to simulate that because. It's the part of the the game you want to to show players. War is hell, and you need smoke. Uh, for example, people say long time ago, I, I wanted some smoke colon about uh, destroyed vehicle in Steel Division Two. That was the first time we want them so big and almost permanent during the battle. And people ask me, but it's it's not gameplay. It's not important. And I say, yes, it's important because. You want to put the player in a real war, and that's the part of the war. Wreck burning make very dark clouds, and you want them, and you want them to go high in the sky because it it puts the the ground into perspective, and it's uh, it's 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 what I I call the guts feelings. Same from the sound or tracers or explosion or impact. You can't be realistic and. I've, after what we saw right now uh, in the world, I can say that people tend to think that uh, no tank does not explode in the Hollywood way. 
know, sorry, but what I see right now, it's huge explosion, bigger than I thought and bigger than I made for one. You probably have the same feeling. We are, we usually simulate a world more simple and less intense than the reality. Yeah, it's actually incredible how large an ammo cook-off is in uh, in real yeah. life with a full carousel. Um, that's that's something that I noticed as well. I mean, we I, I may have gone a little too hard on our um, our fire system for ammunition. You know, it has like oxygen simulation and things like this going on. It probably wasn't necessary, but it does produce some interesting uh, varied cook-offs. It, it's not random. It's all. Um, deterministic but it tends to be different each time based on what got shot and how the fire is progressing and then the flip side to that is uh it still has to be controlled right if the if the detonations are enormous and you get a full rack going up that the physics on the turret could send it to incredible heights and i i want to have a limit of believability you know if the turret goes into space it's going to look weird even if I think, oh, maybe there was some formula justifying it, I still have to put a limit on the force, you know. So there's always kind of like that hand on the scale, trying to make sure that it looks the way you expect, even if you're simulating something. Um, that's 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 one of the fun parts of doing a simulation, and it's also a game, and you have to walk that balance between the two. You always have to decide where to intervene and say, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna let the simulation run crazy on this one. We have to put some limitations there. The first time I show the people the the turret flying uh, at the, the the start of Warno uh, three years ago, people say, "Whoa, the turret is going so uh, in, in eight uh, and, and far away. It's not realistic." And now I show them video about some turrets who, who jump. I don't know, maybe uh, five, uh, some of the turrets I, I saw in video are f unbelievably. Uh, uh, I couldn't believe my my eyes when I saw the video. The, the turret is flying way, way more than in Wano. It's, it's like they are in, from paper. I am aware of one case from 2002 where a turret flew 41 meters in distance. <laughs> in lateral distance. In lateral distance. Wow. That one wins the Olympics. It's <laughs> a good throw. I, re I, I really like uh, playing uh, Gunner Eat PC because w when I was young, uh, I'm 51. W when I was young, I, I was playing um, Sherman M4 on uh, Atari uh, 5200. And uh, the, the first real game uh, I was, uh, I, I like from this kind of game was Team Yankee. It was um, a game you can play four units at the same time on your screen. And it was the first time I played a a Cold War uh, game uh, simulation. It was uh, you, you. You can fight with Bradley, uh, Abrams, of course, and uh, probably uh, Patton. I'm, I can't remember. And th after that, uh, I, I was um, I was fan of uh, Micropros. Uh, I think it was the name was M1. Yeah, M1 Tank M1. Platoon. M1 Tech Platoon, exactly, Micropros. That was uh, the first time I was uh, really in, uh, in Platoon Command of uh, a modern tank. And the uh, first time I saw a uh, turret flying, I think. Uh, after that, uh, I was, uh, it was a long time ago, Steel Beast, of course. Mm -hmm. The Steel Beast, um, uh, after, uh, before it was professional, Steel Beast, or where I learned to, uh, to use all the learning, uh, range finding uh, on two axis, uh, on simulators, uh, and things like that. So uh, when, I, when, I, <laughs> when I jump on Gunnery PC, I was not lost. Uh, but I really like um, the, the way you handle mission, for, because um, I, I'm trying one, and, and one again, and, and one again, and, one, and I want the perfect. Uh, uh, the last time I, I tried to stop, uh, I don't remember the name of the uh, of the mission. I, uh, you, you have a Bradley platoon, and you have to to stop uh, two waves of uh, armor red, probably a T60, sixty two. Oh yeah, uh, crossword screen. Twine. Yeah, it's a hard mission. 
uh, and I, and I, I only win um, because I was uh, at one point I said uh, I will I will do like Hastings and um, I was waiting them <laughs> just behind the hill uh, and I uh, engaged them uh, with uh, uh, auto cannon <laughs> at short range because it, it was my only option to uh, to survive the last wave uh, and it, 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 in that moment I like our game because. Uh, uh, you are in the war, really, uh, and that's exactly what I want to achieve. Uh, the situation is almost more important than the simulation. The fact that you wait behind a, a, a hill, you wait the enemy, you, you hear it, uh, the tankers are, are approaching, and you saw them, and you, you aim to the weak point, and you get them, it's, uh, it's incredible. And uh, I think one month later, I saw the video of the uh, Bradley, uh, Ukrainian Bradley, who engaged uh, uh, a tank at short range, and and, uh, and I said, no, I was that, I was here, I do that exactly." <laughs> it's the thing. That's yeah. I, uh, I I like that you enjoyed that. That mission in particular is a very difficult one. At some point, we really have to start tagging missions for difficulty so people know what they're getting into because it's very common for someone to say, "How in the hell do I beat Crossroads Screen? I have <laughs> I only have four Bradleys. They have so many tanks. It takes me too long to reload my tow. What do I do?" And that one's really about positioning. In the end, it's a it's a very difficult one uh, compared to the rest of the missions. Uh, I wanted to go back a little bit though to what you said about the um, the battlefield being hell and, and you have to convey that sense of chaos. I've heard that described as uh, the dirty battlefield, like just so much dust and smoke and the longer the fight happens, the more obscuration there is. We're just now starting to approach that uh, since we got our VFX guy going uh, many months back and he started cooking up some better effects. We have these lingering dust clouds and, and things like that. Um, once you get like the smoke going off and the dust from firing and everything, some of the screenshots that I've seen people take in Gunner Heat PC, it really starts to look like that. That sense of there's just this fog over everything, and this, you can tell that there's chaos happening. It's not just a clean scene with some tanks and some muzzle flashes. It's all it's all mired in particulate. I think that's a really cool effect. That's the difference between a simulator, like Steel Beast, and the game we, we, we do. The game we do is a battlefield simulator. That's the, the, the term we use. The Warno is a, a Cold War simulator, a battlefield simulator. And if you want to simulate a battlefield, you have to simulate units, but also feelings. And that's why uh, your acknowledge in, uh, in Galerite PC are perfect, because uh, you, you, you can feel the, the crew in panic when you get get it, and that's um, what I want uh, for one or two. Uh, that's exactly what we want to put people in the shoes of different things. You want to put them in the crew, in the tank crew, and we want to put them in the command of a, a large interim battle. But that's the same objective. At the end, they f we want them to feel that they fight. A, a, a real battle uh, from the sound from uh, and and for us it's very special because <clears throat> we also want to uh, to put them in a battle in uh, in a time period the 80s with music sounds but also uh, in in our blog uh, the, the kind of clothes people wears at this uh, at this part and uh, we had we were lucky because at the time we we launched uh, Warno uh, the 80s was uh, were in a in a big comeback with probably Stranger Things effects and mm. synthwave uh, effects. So now the 80s is on uh, on the top mode, and uh, we were at the perfect time to uh, to to give people this kind of simulation. So, yes, the 80s was a very cool period. I, I was raised uh, during that time. But it was also a time when uh, there was two Germany. A lot of people didn't know about that anymore. Uh, and uh, I, I, I was making some uh, drill about uh, atomic uh, uh, strike in, the, in 1982, 1983. That's something people tend to forget about. 
uh, even if now Cold War and 80s come back to the to the um, the new uh, the new style, and uh, we are living in a world after all uh, very close to what it was in the 80s. It's very strange, but uh, that's probably why so much things. Uh, uh, make some echoes about uh, the game we do right now. It's the past, but it's also very now, because after all, what we see at the news, it's the same tank. We, we, we literally saw the tank we had in your game, and your game is it's for, for 40 years in the past, but it's the same now. It's very, very, very weird. Yeah, for sure. I, I do like the fact that there's that... Um resurgence of interest in the history even though we're both working on alternative histories where there's a war that never actually happened it's still based on a real situation you know the the lore of the game uh, for either of our games right up to the point where the war starts is just real life that's that's the lore so you have these real units and these real pieces of equipment and all the combatants are this are real countries um, that's a good way to teach people what the situation was. Like people who don't know anymore that there was a, a division between the two halves of Germany and why that happened. You jump into Warno or you jump into Gunner Heat PC and you see these things about East Germany, West Germany, and you say, "Huh, what, what is what is that?" And then now you now you know something that you didn't before, and you you can start to learn. I I, uh, I sometimes wish that there was more opportunity to put the history directly in the game have some kind of a, a lore feature or, or a little information blurbs because it's such a fascinating thing but i suppose people can dive into that on their own the you know to the extent that they want to sometimes a good approach to this is basically just like um let, let a person just see it see how they feel about it and then they'll go research it themselves then they'll start reading 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 discussing it and there you have it. Before you know it, we get a new nerd in the community. <laughs> and life will never be the same. Indeed. I think the the thing that's... Well, it's a really unique setting. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I wasn't super aware of what was going on uh, as far as the Cold War goes. I, my, my story of um, when I realized that the Soviet Union had collapsed was uh, the intro to Captain Planet. There was a character who was from the Soviet Union and they introduced her as from the Soviet Union. And one day that changed and it said from Eastern Europe. And when I was like a four-year-old kid or something, I was thinking, what happened to the Soviet Union? <laughs> you know? And that was about, that was pretty much my entire exposure to it until I was a little bit older and understood what was going on. Um, but the interesting thing is um, before all that kind of, before it all tapered down and, and, and it wasn't a, you know, the, the so-called like uh, the end of history or whatever, where um, the, the Russians turned out to not have any cash anymore. And, um, and the Americans uh, went and did their Gulf war thing and showed that they could just uh, do whatever they want. Basically. Um, it's kind of like everyone's grown up in that world where um, there's no wars anymore, basically. Well, there are wars, but, you know, no uh, wars between superpowers. And it kind of created this interesting um, illusion that um, that superpowers all have invincible equipment or whatever, right? But now we're sort of seeing that, like, uh, when, when, this, when this all does kick off, and we're only seeing kind of a small version of what it would have been, and it's just, like, complete hell on Earth. And um, I think that's, like, uh, at least for me, the interesting thing about the setting is like you shouldn't play this game like if if we if we create a game that people will play and they decide they want to join the army i think we've maybe done it wrong um this isn't a fun job it's like it's kind of i don't know at least to me i'm interested in creating a horror game almost because i don't know it's 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 not it's not a nice situation. It's not a hero story. It's like a, it's just bad. <laughs> it's like a bad experience for everyone. Yeah, that that's why I call the the hell on the earth, battlefield hell. Um, a lot of people ask us uh, if we are pro war or things like that. I, I think we only we only 
two in the in the team, maybe three, who did the army, and because uh, it was <laughs> I was a conscript for France. Uh, usually, uh, we are not um, in military. We are probably more uh, nerds, gamers, and format math historian, uh, and we want to share uh, the passion of the history. And, yes, we're more into histories and military. Yeah. And, 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 and like you say, uh, if we can teach something about uh, what we, what we, uh, the, the luck, the luck we have to not have the Cold War going out uh, in the 80s, it's to, to say to people, but please, right now, <laughs> we are again closed uh, to uh, the Third World War. Uh, we have we had some luck one time please play your game and tell and tell everyone to not start uh, the the thing we we we, we missed uh, 30 years ago uh, that's that's uh, that's important yeah i, I can understand what uh, what you say about it. but yes i think uh, video game are a good way to enter uh, to interest people to history uh, in my opinion, that's what we do. We we are more uh, making a, a game about history than, uh, than really a pro-military game. Uh, as for me, uh, I, I became a World War II nerd playing uh, Close Combat 3. I loved War Movie, but uh, as soon as I started playing Close Combat, uh, I was researching equipment, uh, every from individual weapon to, to tanks. Um, it's it's been a uh, yeah a hobby and a passion to, still today, and it's the same for the Cold War. I wasn't uh, much of a Cold War buff until I play uh, Operation Flashpoint. Operation Flashpoint. Uh, I love that game. And when we started uh, working on one oh, it was uh, I, I started from there, and uh, I really discovered uh, the Cold War uh, when we were working on war game. Since I'm not as old as Stefan, uh, I was 11 when the Berlin Wall fell, so I remember about it. But uh, I remember when it happened, I realized it was a world-changing event, but uh, I was too small before that to realize we were, we were close to war. Yeah. Uh, for, for example, uh, I, I like to, to remember uh, to people uh, this kind of event, uh, maybe um, Mad Matt will, will, will talk better than me about that, the, um, the Eber Archer in incident. Uh, people uh, usually never know about uh, this incident. And when I, I, I say to them that it's one of the six times we were very, very close to a real World War Three at this point uh, during the Eber Archer exercise. And people uh, are usually what? It, it was so close. Yes, it was so close to um, to, to to start the the, the World War Three, and that's why now, if you read about Eberacher, but there is at least six times we were so close about the starting a war. You know that right now <laughs> we can be in the same situation, and that's not because we were lucky seven times in the past. We or maybe we use uh, all the or cat lives, and uh, we, we will not uh, support another Eberache exercise. There, uh, there could be even more than that. I, I'm not going to get into detail, but I've talked to um, many people who were in uh, the armored forces in the time and place that we are depicting in uh, Gunner Heat PC, and they have stories, lots of stories. And I've heard some things, uh, things that happened that were very close to becoming inc incidents, kind of like, uh, not famous like Abel Archer, but uh, similar in severity. And it, it really sounds like everyone was just on a hair trigger for decades, and we had a lot of close calls. It's a pretty scary thing to think about. Yeah, that's, that's why... That's exactly why it's important to to put in phase on this situation because at this time uh, I was younger, but uh, I was older than Manmat, so 
when I was raised in, in the 18th, uh, it was my greatest fear, the atomic war. Uh, my, my first movie who made me realize that was the day after the, the, the movie about nuclear war, not the shit movie about uh, called uh, uh, situation now, the, the day after the, the atomic war. And uh, I remember it well. I think in, it was in 1986, of course. Uh, I, I was living near Grenoble. Uh, I, will, I will do the, the short story. Uh, and it, there was an atomic center here. <clears throat> and one day, uh, my neighbors came to see us and say, he was walking on the atomic center and he says, don't, don't go out. There's something, something very strange. All who are atomic alarms. Uh, re, uh, was uh, starting today. Uh, so we are looking for a leak on uh, on the atomic uh, sector. There's something uh, very strange. And the next day, he come back with the gay gear um, uh, uh, tools, and uh, it was uh, radioactivity everywhere. And he said, "Stop eating uh, vegetables. Don't go out. There's something. Maybe your bombs explode somewhere, but we don't." And of course, it was Chernobyl, but that was, I, I was here. I was uh, old enough to understand that something very dangerous and important uh, occurred, and I was terrified about it. In my mind, if you know that, it, it, it was like there was a war on the East, and everyone doesn't want to, to tell you about. Uh, it was the, the very first time I realized that something could could go very very wrong, and I was raised with uh, Iran Iraq war on on the news, Falkland, uh, and all this war. But these days, something with the atom was here, and it was frightening. That's uh, something that we've kind of lost over time. Well, thankfully, uh, that's not on everybody's mind uh, at the moment. But it's a piece of um, it, it. There's cultural scars from it almost and and there, that's a real thing and a real fear that happened um i like that we can at least remind younger generations uh, who didn't live through that uh, that this was a thing that happened and it's almost like a cautionary tale uh, but there's another aspect of the history of cold war stuff that i like which is um it harkens back to an era where the uh the western powers were not invincible or or didn't have this perception of invincibility there was a it, it would have been a peer fight if the cold war had turned into a hot war and there's a lot of a lot of uh perceptions that would not have been borne out like um you probably know the desert storm effect where people think that the abrams is invulnerable and the t-72 is trash and uh yeah you know, exactly. t tow missiles beat everything and air power is supreme like these are all things that they may be true in some regard and in some limited situations now but they would not have been true in 1985 1989 it would have been a brutal slugfest and and for every super weapon there was an equal on the other side or some way to counter it and uh, I think you get that. Um, I, I'm not sure if you guys have seen the same thing, but when we first released Soviets in uh, Gunner Heat PC, people were stunned to see how easily an Abrams could be killed by um, by a, a peer tank, you know, a, a T-80 or a, a T-64 using modern ammunition, you know, that kind of thing. It's not what you would expect if all you've seen is, uh, you know, History Channel documentaries about Iraq. It's a, it's a different situation. Yes, I, I think the West won the Cold War by not fighting it. If the war had gone hot, uh, in my opinion, uh, nothing would have stopped the, the Warsaw Pact. But maybe internal division, but um, it's not uh, NATO's army would have stopped uh, the Soviet and Allies until they reached the Rhine, at least the Rhine. Uh, the only the only thing would have been to to use uh, these nuclear weapons. Pluton missile will stop them. Yeah, <laughs> France, France was ready to vitrify Germany to stop them before the Rhine. It will be stopped. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think, like, um, from a storytelling perspective, it's kind of like I I always think of. Um, 
the Game of Thrones TV show. I know this is a weird reference to make, but hear me out. Um, the thing that that uh, show did, or I guess originally the books, but the, the show really, like, it was mass market, right? Like, a lot of people watched that show. And I think the thing that it did a little bit differently to what else was popular at the time is all of a sudden, uh, protagonists could die. Protagonists could lose and be taken away. And I think that's, like, um, a pretty big difference with... It's something that our, both of our games have in common and something that differentiates them against the games of the 2000s and 2010s that are all, um, you know, counterinsurgency themed and all like people's idea of what the army's job is, is just winning in those days. And now it's kind of like the world's getting a little bit of a reminder that it's like, oh, I actually was like not a, you know, it's, it's not a story with a protagonist. It's just like a bad idea that you should probably not do. Yeah, it's not going to turn out well for anyone involved. It's uh, it's going to be who loses harder, not uh, not a, a triumphant one-sided uh, smash by one force. I like when people play GHPC and they say that they were impacted by like the the emotion of it, like the the crew panicking. You know, the people making comments like, "I could hear my 19-year-old commander screaming his head off as we were about to get roasted by a T-80, and then all of a sudden I felt something." Like to me, that's a, it's a, it's a success. That is, uh, you know, message sent. That's the that's the mood we're trying to convey. That's that's very perfectly working on on your game there exactly. And I remember we in war game we had a mission, a campaign uh, after the bomb. If I remember it well, after the bomb or you manage some uh, how we call them the, the ghost army. You know people who who've been irradiated to death. Walking, and the walking wa dead. The walking dead because they only have uh, one or two uh, days. Uh, before, uh, you know, when you have been irradiated to death, you have a, a small time period when everything is okay, and then you will uh, you will fall in, in burning. It's and not we... uh, it's not nuclear radiation. It's it was a neutron bomb, I think, who produced that effect. Yeah, it, people, that's, it was, that's... it's a bomb that uh, designed to destroy people and not uh, not arm the uh, infrastructure. So, but the issue is that people take about six or seven days to die and uh, they realized it was a bad idea because during that period they had nothing to lose so it could be very they could go berserk and it was when we read about that i think it was panzer who brought it up it gave us the idea to make a, a campaign about uh, people like that who are who have been neutralized and uh, on both sides they don't give a shit about the war and they go they go they lost the they lost match, family they lost friends, they lost family, they know they are dead in one, two, three, four days and they still have some weapon and they, they fight each other. It, it, it was a terrifying idea, but it was also exactly what we want to achieve. We want to, uh, to, to say that even if the war, nuclear war starts, uh, people we are st we were still fighting after that and it was terrifying to, to, to think about that. Uh, that's exactly what we talked about uh, before. Uh, we wanted to put the players in a situation, worldly situation, awkward situation, when the thing is not, uh, the war is not as cool as as you can think about. Uh, and that's exactly what I feel when when I'm in in tank in Gunnery PC and, and I take one hit or two and people begin to scream. And uh, that's exactly uh, what, it, it's, it's the difference between a simulation and a battlefield simulation. And that's not Hollywood, that's the guts effect, what I call the guts effect. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that basically got my attention with early war game back in 2011, was it? is that every unit had a surname attached to it so that it's not just like a unit like in Command and Conquer Generals. It's basically, hey, there's a guy inside. There's maybe more than one guy inside. And I'm just like sending them off to die. This this sucks. This really... Yeah, I love that about Wargame and Warno, actually. I. Uh, I think at one point when we were talking internally in the Radiant team about how do we 
convey the horror of the war um we brought up your games and like look they have names on everybody there's there's actual people like explicitly indicated we should do that we should have the crew i think we probably will at some point have the crew named because it's such a it's such a blunt way to accomplish it like hey dipshit these are not like machines that think for themselves and you just throw them into a grinder for fun there's actual people uh you know and maybe we we have the voices and stuff to accomplish that somewhat but then seeing a casualty list that really drives it home like oh those were actual human beings that died that's this is not just fun and games even though it is a game that's why in army general you can uh, have the, the list of kill at the end of the of the game because you have so many units at the start with the biggest campaign is so many units at the start and when you finish finish them you have so much losses on the other side and you 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 take a moment to 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 think about the, the number of people and then you take the european theaters and you say but that's only a small part of what would the world war three would be that's um I, I really don't know how the thing will 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 go at this time, um, but um, it's. I think it's it's still not uh, believable right now in my mind to uh, to try to figure out the, the the best way to figure out is something between uh, Red Storm Rising from Clancy, uh, who in fact is a small scale, at least, and no atomic uh, uh, engagement, uh, but. It's hard to understand how much units, men, regiments for just one attack. Um, t today, if uh, if uh, two uh, two blocks do that, they probably can can fight for three days, four days, and there will be no ammo on 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 any side. At this time, it was not the case. Yeah, it's uh, I pretty sober. I think I once read that uh, the life expect expectancy of, uh, of a British soldier, it, it was a, a study made by the British Army, the life expect expectancy of a, a British soldier on the front line uh, during an, uh, a Soviet attack was to be counted in minutes. Yeah, that's the same thing that, um, what was it, Black Horse, the unit, the, the US Armored Cav unit right on the border? Yeah. They, uh, 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 they were they were um, the news they were fighting a, a sacrificial mission yeah and it was it, it, them they had uh, an almost uh, no uh, life expectancy uh, in case of war yep we've talked to a few guys that were stationed there and it was um they, they said the same thing they understood that they were going to be like directly in the grinder if anything kicked off and they were kind of a delaying action and that must have been a pretty a pretty rough place to be in <laughs> Luckily, when I was in the army, I was at the, the train, I was at the logistical. I, I, I was put it behind, not in the front, but just behind. But I was told that my life expectancy would be two days. So when we start the maneuvers, I only received two boxes of meals because it, it would be enough anyway. So you don't have to, to have more food than that. That's two days. That's not so bad after all. <laughs> That's pretty but green. The, <laughs> yeah, but the French MRE is just like so nice. He would probably be able to survive for three. So huge! It was yeah. so huge. It's you can't imagine the size of that thing. If you can find a American or British soldier, you can swap it for about a week rations, so you can survive. I was keeping them and getting back home to uh, to eat because it was better than that the, the most part I could buy uh, with my uh, military money anyways. So I, I, I gather them every time I could. <laughs> to, it, it was pretty famous and still today it was the the military ration number one and and, and I test them I ate them it, it's real uh, and and if you see the size of the box for for one day. You have two when you go uh, for military uh, practice. You got two boxes, but uh, my God, this this thing is bigger than your guns and your ammo, that and you have like, everything inside. Sounds like good priorities to me, to be honest. <laughs> Eat up. You, you take a lot of calories to do maneuvers, right? Every army is marching on its stomach. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, with... it's from Napoleon. It's, it's the same on the French army. Yeah. There we go. We brought it back around to French generals. Um, <laughs> we uh, we're coming up on an hour and a half here. Do we have any uh, any points that you guys want to hit? Uh, make sure that you have a certain uh, message go out or any, any interesting stuff you want to bring up at the end. Yeah, I would I would like to say that I'm really loving that the Cold War is now becoming the thing that there are like many studios just like approaching this same scenario which I continued which I consider to be one of the most interesting ones in history and not only that I can always use um, whenever whenever somebody asks me oh why does T72 has such low range I just say to them well go in GHPC and ask them see how it works there <laughs> fair enough yeah, but for my part, uh, I'm sure we, we will deliver uh, great games and uh, we can uh, enjoy uh, crossing uh, all our publics, uh, each other about, uh, about the, the, the subject because uh, it's a cool thing to, to talk with other devs uh, uh, from, because we, we're really working on the same, we're on the same boat, basically, so... Um, we are almost ready, and I hope you will be soon, so uh, we can play your game uh, to the death soon. Yes, <laughs> for sure. I, I really love that we're in the same uh, ideatic space with our, our subject matter, and we can refer people to each other's projects. Oh, you want to do more of a large-scale strategic? Go play Warno. Oh, you want to do tank on tank? Go play GHPC. It's a, it's a great crossover. <laughs> Right. I do think it's like, um, uh, like I said at the start, it's like, I, I don't think people realize how, um, mo like if, if there's people making a game that's kind of in this sort of space, they probably, like there's usually someone on the team that knows someone else on the team sort of thing. Like there's always a little connection there. Um, and I think it's cool to, I don't know, I don't, I don't think I've seen it really um, that leveraged and and turned into something that the the players can sort of enjoy a little bit and that's the idea of uh doing this i suppose yeah we like showing the 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 inside the human side of making the games and and really conveying like hey it's a small world we're all people we kind of know each other we have these thoughts and ideas and we love to get that out there for the audience to understand yeah very small world for a very small team usually Mm-hmm. But rather, I really think that all games begin to uh, to, to to be um, huge, 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 uh, very huge uh, things on the scene. So it's uh, it's it would be interesting to see uh, how it uh, all things will turn uh, in the, f the close future about uh, all those games. 